Uh, so it is 7.33 p.m. on Tuesday, the 25th of January, 2022. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm that members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Daniel Riccadelli. Here. And Ben Kinholi. Here. Good evening to all. Uh, people, uh, town officials, uh, Rick Valorelli, the board's administrator. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Uh, and assisting uh, also from the Department of Plant, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, from Special Services, Vincent Lee. Oh, cough drops. Let's see, I see Vincent's tag, so I believe he's here. Um, and I, are, I believe that is all. I don't see anyone else on behalf of the town here this evening. Uh, appearing for 1160. Lowell Street. Uh, Mr. Nessie, good to see you. Yes. yes, good to see you as well. And I believe you are also appearing for 83 Palmer Street? Yes, and I am going to be asking that that matter be continued. I sent a letter to the board. Hopefully you did receive that. Okay. Uh, and then is there anyone here appearing on behalf of 25 Highland Avenue? Don't see Ms. Ben, but I believe she was her intention, and Mr. Valorelli, you can confirm that her intention was to continue this evening. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay. <clears throat> Start with first item on our agenda, which is our remote participation details. This open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency signed into law on June 16th, 2021. This act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may continue to meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Other participants are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including the display of an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. <clears throat> as the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the town of Arlington, Massachusetts, just discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters. The board hereby acknowledges that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. Uh, and so, at the next item on our agenda, number two, we have items two through seven are administrative. I'm going to go ahead and um, move those to the end this evening so we can move forward on other matters. I'm going to go ahead straight to docket item, num uh, excuse me, to agenda item number 10, which is docket 3677. Um, Ms. Ban is not here at the moment, but <clears throat> she had requested, she, at the end of the last meeting, we had approved a special permit, but there was still an open variance request. Um, and she was waiting on information to come from her uh, engineers. That information has not made its way to her yet. And so um, there's nothing to discuss. So she has asked for a continuance. 
Um, <clears throat> I had spoken with Mr. Valarelli this morning. Um, it looks like our continuation date, our next hearing will be February 22nd. Um, so if I could have a motion to continue uh, the hearing for 25 Highland Avenue until Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022. So moved. Thank you, may I have a second? Second. second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Uh, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye, so the, the <clears throat> docket 367725 Highland Avenue is continued to Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022 at 7.30 p.m. And then with that, I will move backwards up to um, agenda item number nine, which is docket number 3658, 83 Palmer Street. Um, Mr. Nessie is here on behalf of the applicant and Mr. Nessie, as you had said earlier, your intention is to request a continuance on this? Yes, it is. It, uh, I did receive uh, uh, Doug Himes' uh, memo and uh, I, I read it very carefully and I was fully prepared to uh, proceed uh, with uh, my zoning app based upon that memo. However, my client has indicated that uh, he is going to be filing plans I think he's prepared them already with the building uh, department uh, applying for a permit in accordance with section 5.42 subsection B for the subsection eight, which of course is the energy efficient bylaw. Uh, it's a new uh, provision in the zoning bylaw, uh, which allows an applicant to file for a building permit in an R1 or an R2 or an, uh, or an R0 zone and, and gain certain relief uh, because they're going to be building an energy efficient home. What I do not want to do is give up uh, my ability to pursue this matter mm -hmm. uh, if in fact uh, those plans do not uh, follow through to fruition. That's the reason I, I'm asking that this matter be continued until the next uh, zoning hearing. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so with, uh, are there any questions from the board? With that, I would look for a motion to continue the special permit hearing for 83 Palmer Street until Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022 at 7.30 p.m. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Rigardelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are continued on 83 Palmer Street until Thank you. Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022 at 7.30 p.m. And with that, um, <clears throat> next item we'll take up is item number eight which is uh, docket number 3687, 1113 Lowell Street. Yes. Um, and with that, uh, I will introduce Mr. Inessi, if he can go ahead and tell us what he would like to do. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I believe I'm accompanied this evening by Jason Kahn, who is the architect, uh, and by Chris Garalopoulos, who is the owner of the property as well. Uh, I will uh, make uh, my opening statement uh, and, and Jason Kahn may want to jump in or you may, may have questions for him. Uh, the, uh, I filed the application uh, with respect to uh, simply an appeal from the building inspector uh, where the building inspector indicated to me uh, that uh, he could not corroborate the fact that the use uh, was in fact a two family use. Uh, and uh, by the way, I received Mike Champa's uh, uh, memo to the zoning board about a half an hour ago. I hadn't, hadn't seen it before then. I did have a chance to read it. Uh, so I know what it says. So I'm not uh, being ambushed, okay? And I'll say that for the board. Uh, the, uh, uh, 
property uh, is a building that was built in 1816. And I'm um, given uh, to understand, uh, and Jason Kahn can corroborate this, that the clients have been before the historic commission and with their plans uh, to do some work on the building. And those plans have in fact been approved. Uh, again, I wasn't uh, involved at that point, uh, but uh, Jason Kahn yeah. talked to that issue uh, 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 a bit later. Uh, uh, we're here really on the issue of whether in fact the use is a two family use. Now, my uh, memo to the board, which I hope uh, you've had a chance to read, uh, basically cites a couple of uh, uh, documents from the building department. And this is the same old story, unfortunately, with the building department, uh, where records cannot be found that go back to the 1950s and the 1960s. What could be found with respect to uh, the use of the property was a building card, which I have given you in my memo and cited in my memo as well. And that the building card uh, essentially uh, is dated October 10 of 1961. And uh, it's, it indicates subject, alter a three family dwelling to a four family dwelling. So that again is dated October 10 of 1961. Uh, and very interestingly, directly beneath that, it says permit 201 uh, on July 17 of 1961. I've given that to you as well as part of my memo. And that permit uh, essentially, which again predates the zoning case, but that permit talks about the addition of a room on the second floor on the side of the house. Now, uh, I can only surmise because, again, I don't have any uh, documentary uh, uh, information that I can argue and show to the board. I can only surmise that the reason why permit number 201 was written under the building card uh, for the, uh, the grant of the uh, uh, relief from a three family to a four family was to basically retroactively uh, approve that uh, permit uh, to add that room. Uh, adding that room would be a furtherance of uh, any contention that in fact, the building was a four and not a two. Uh, why would there be uh, a permit to add an additional room uh, on the building when it already had uh, at least uh, two or three rooms, uh, it, but for the fact that uh, it was, uh, it, you know, based upon uh, uh, something that went before the zoning board, the zoning board looked at it and the zoning board basically uh, uh, said, okay, uh, they may, perhaps they should not have done that, but it was done. And uh, we're now going to corroborate that and we're doing that by way of uh, the grant of the permit. Again, no decision can be found. Uh, and you know, it gets a little bit frustrating for applicants to uh, essentially uh, have a home uh, that they understand is a two, a four, or a three, uh, and uh, operate on that basis. Uh, and then at some point, check with the building department and find out that the building department has the property listed uh, in this case as a two family and not a four family. Uh, the assessing record uh, of course indicates that the property is a four family, no question about that. Uh, so uh, again, our position is that the uh, property is in fact a four family. Our position is that the building card that was issued by the zoning board um, and in the contained in the records of the building department clearly state alteration of a three family dwelling to a four family dwelling. Now, are we to totally ignore that and say that that isn't 
a document that folks going to the building department cannot rely on for the purpose of knowing what the status of their property is. I don't think that that's, that's fair. I don't think that that's equitable. Uh, and uh, I just, I'm asking the board not to, in fact, conclude that. Now, I did have a chance quickly to read uh, Mr. Champa's uh, memo as well. And uh, I note that uh, he uh, does say that at the time of the decision in question, it was common practice for the zoning board to grant a use change with a five to 10 year limit or expire upon new ownership. Uh, I can't honestly say that I ever experienced that on any case I had before the zoning board. Going back to the 19, late 1960s uh, onward, uh, uh, there might have been uh, a, a condition uh, that basically was a condition subsequent uh, that uh, uh, resulted from the grant of a special permit where if the ownership changed, uh, then the new owner would have to come back before the zoning board. But I never experienced uh, that with a change of use, uh, quite frankly. And I, I think uh, if, in, if in fact that did happen, that certainly would be uh, a violation of the, uh, of the law as it existed then, and probably any local bylaw as well. I mean, why would you uh, 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 allow a grant of zoning relief for a use? A person then purchases the property for that use, and then it gets sold two years later, and the <laughs> use that they thought they had, they don't have, uh, because uh, that use basically was extinguished by virtue of that uh, prior zoning case. Again, I never experienced that. If it happened, I'm not questioning Mr. Champa. He's the building inspector. Uh, he has access to records I don't have access to, but I never saw that in my experience. Again, I might've seen that within a special permit situation, but never in a change of use situation. So essentially uh, I'm asking, uh, and it, it, it's actually a very limited matter before the board, I did submit a plans to the board so the board could see uh, what the uh, applicant was uh, planning to do with the property. Uh, everything that's being done with the property uh, is being done within the footprint of the property. We're not exceeding the footprint. Uh, and again, Jason Kahn can talk about that. I'm doing more talking uh, that Jason would uh, otherwise do because he basically, he basically uh, is experiencing COVID. Uh, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually here. I'm here. All right, Jason. Jason, why yes. don't you, uh, you can jump in. Uh, again, Jason, we're not here for the purpose of discussing building plans. We're Sorry. here for the purpose of discussing the use. So we don't have to get into an elaboration uh, with regard to building plans, okay? It, uh, the question before the zoning board is going to be whether, in fact, uh, I can get relief from the board with respect to the property not being a two, but rather being a four unit residential use. Okay, um, I, can, I can give you a very quick history of how I'm involved with this. Is prior, prior to the, the current owners, I was became involved with uh, from what I was told, a, um, a problematic, I believe it was being used as seven unit kind of illegal kitchens here and there. So it was a life safety matter that I was brought into this at the beginning, which resulted in, um, you know, recommendations and a report to the prior owner. Um, when, I, when I walked it the first time, it was pretty uh, rough inside. Um, you know, I didn't know it was for the purpose of, of sale, although there was a lawyer involved at the time. Um, there was definitely, definitely three extra kitchens or somewhat kind of quasi kitchens. And it was a kind of a rundown, um, kind of like elderly, I don't really, it wouldn't even be a group home is what it was. Um, 
So <clears throat> I, I was not, in, you know, brought into to look at the zoning or anything, more like from a life safety perspective and looking at the overall structure and, and um, you know, the need for potentially life safety measures. Um, they ended up selling to, um, you know, new clients. Um, you know, during that time, I was provided with a bunch of documentation from, you know, the National Historic Registry all the way to uh, which, which it's on. And it's got a little bit of a story to it, the Benjamin Lockhouse. Um, and it's on the Historic Registry. So I, I'm intimately involved with it now. Uh, I then got hired by the new, the new owners to convert this into, um, and not really convert, renovate, I should say. As it stood, it was, when I walked it the first time, I have, I have a uh, Matterport scan of the building. There were seven units. Not that there was legal, I'm just reporting on what I saw. Um, some of them were vacant, some were not. It was in very bad shape. Um, obviously, I wrote a report to the owner then saying, you know, egress-wise and life safety, that there, there was a set of decks on the left and the right that were rotted, rotted out. It just looked bad. It looked like a, a hazard. Uh, no other way to, to really say anything otherwise. So when the new owner took over, they wanted to, you know, perform a bad renovation. Um, which uh, at the time I forget, I, I must have reached out to the special services um, and, you know, kind of went back and forth. It's in a two family zone, um, you know, and, and at that point we, we went through the process and, and filed a, our initial submission that, that triggered a um, historical review or historical, forgive me, I, I, I haven't, um, I, I think it was a historical, it was jo Joanne Robinson and um, Victoria Rose uh, was who I dealt with, and I can't remember. There's a there's a, a board. Um, I know there's two in, in Arlington. Um, that we went through five or six iterations of exterior preservation of the front building. At that point, we realized that uh, we don't have to do the historic all over again, Jason. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So either way, a bunch of additions throughout the years that were permitted. Uh, my purpose was to provide a safe code compliant by a sprinkler alarm monitored um you know upgrade of what was there which was uh not like the only way to describe it is it, it was pretty close to the, the rear of this building was had multiple additions that you can see um over the years probably predates all of us um you know that's that's kind of my background so what you're looking at is just a is a uh i can tell you the end result of the historic that's important um historic the end result was rem remove the rear of the building rebuilding kind on the footprint of the existing foundation a match of the existing historical house so it's basically you turn it 90 degrees and built the same thing that was there but code compliant and that's kind of what you're looking at here um you know i wasn't able I, you know I, did, I was there was no need for relief that i thought of because we, we, we weren't going for anything that wasn't there prior. Um, you know, that, that, that's basically my role. I can speak to, speak to uh, you know, I can speak to anything uh, that, that you want in between from the start to where we are now. Uh, there's been a lot of revisions, spent a lot of time collectively to kind of satisfy historical and, and we can stay within code compliance and, uh, and basically fix what was there before because it was, like I said, uh, Jason, but, did, did Historic yeah. approve the plans? Yeah, Historic approved the plans. Um, I spoke to Miss Robinson, who, who, who lost her drive or, or lost her date on her drive. And I don't know the process if it gets recorded in, you know, like other places or if it's not. But she's, she said that she would reach out to, I don't remember na names, but she, she should have uh, reached out to someone. That I, I sent her the plans that were approved and signed off on. Um, by the historic, and uh, I have I didn't talk to her today. I wasn't able to reach her, um, but she uh, they did sign off. There's there's probably seven meetings that we were attending. All right, all right, Jason. Uh, I, why don't we uh, maybe uh, let the members of the board uh, pose any questions to us that they may have uh, with respect to uh, our position at this point? Okay, right. thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Just following up quickly on uh, what the architect had said. So the, this, the design of the renovation that you have undertaken um, would be done under the 
commercial code as opposed to the single and two family code. And you had said it, so it meets all the fire separation requirements and is gonna be sprinklered under, I guess, 13R? So it's gonna be fully sprinklered, fully monitored, dedicated fire service coming in. So it's gonna be sprinkled under NFP 13, I believe it was 13R, it might be 13. I, I, I get to look okay. at the deep again. I think it's a full a full 13 system only because of, uh, let's see. Um, no, it's 13R, you're absolutely right. So it's not over 12,000 square feet. It meets all the criteria for 13R. Okay, and then has the, um... Do you include in your application, do you or have calculations for the, um, the, the half story on the upper floor? In the, in the existing and the existing or the new? In the new. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do. So okay. kind of hard to gauge what was there before. I, I do have an, I, there should be an as built somewhere. Um, it's similar. It just looked a little different than, you know, the, the design intention as requested was to match the, make the back look like the front. So we within, stay because I, I kind of presume this to stay within the FAR and not not further any non-conformancy or, you know, mm. or, or any of that. I just, it was, we're, they're reusing the existing foundation or that's, okay. that's, that was the plan. Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly switch, I have the, switch to the letter from the building inspector. This one. This is the right one. Yes. This, essentially, this is um, as was um, summarized by Mr. Anessi. Uh, Say again, Chris. I was just saying that the, the letter from Mr. Champa is essentially as you had um, yes. summarized. And just to review the record on the house again, when was the house initially built? 1816. So obviously predating the 1929 bylaw. Yeah, by a few years. And do we know, it, was it originally established as a single family house or a two family house or four, do you know? As of age 16, I can't tell you, uh, Chris. Okay. Yeah. And at what point do we have the first record that indicates that it was for family? The, well, the, certainly the, uh, it was used uh, as a for family for years prior to 1961, but my position is that all we really need to do is look to 1961 because 1961 is the date when the zoning board, and again, uh, Mike Champer is using the word variance, okay? Uh, we don't even know whether it was a variance or a special permit, okay? But uh, as of that date, it's my position and the applicant's position uh, that the uh, property, which had been uh, a three family at that point, according to the building card, was converted to a four family. Uh, so that, uh, that date would commence as far as I'm concerned, when we definitely know that it was a four uh, would be 1961. And that would have nothing to do with the 1925 uh, 
enactment of zoning in, in, in town, but rather that would have to do with a grant of relief from the Zoning Board of Appeal. And that, I, I believe it's up on the screen now, is your exhibit A? Yes. Okay. It's 290 at the top and uh, it starts off 13 Lowell and uh, subject, alter a three family dwelling to a four family dwelling granted October 10 of 1961. And beneath that handwritten in is permit number 201. And permit number 201 is the building uh, uh, a permit that basically uh, predated the grant of zoning relief. And my uh, position on that is that what the zoning board did is the zoning board went ahead and dealt with the, uh, the issue of the permit having been granted uh, perhaps without the proper zoning relief when they acted on October 10 of 1961, having in mind that the building permit to add the room uh, was, uh, I think, in June of 1961. So predated uh, the zoning case. But again, my argument is the poor homeowner uh, is at the mercy of uh, the records in the building department and the records in the building department can be here one second and gone the next. And that puts the homeowner in a very perilous uh, position. Uh, but again, I point to this card and I point to the uh, building permits that issued. And I say, if you look at the two of them, uh, I, I think you can conclude that the zoning board did in fact uh, 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 grant relief for conversion of a three family dwelling to a four. Now, I also argue in my memo, uh, if I'm going to rely on the building permit in June or July of 1961, that in fact, the work went ahead uh, with respect to that. We know that the work went ahead, whether there's a C of O or not, we know the work went ahead and if the work went ahead and the building inspector at the time uh, didn't uh, uh, come down to the property uh, and say to the, ho uh, the homeowner, the property owner, stop, issue a stop order. A and uh, six years went by, uh, a, a building permit had issued and six years went by, then the building department is precluded from stopping uh, that job even now uh, that, and, and saying that it's not a four family use because the six year statute of limitations under chapter 40A, which I cite in my memo has long expired. So the first record we have of four family is that 1961 Yes, I think we could conclude that, uh, Chris, by yeah. just looking at the language, alter a three family to a four family. Okay. Yes. And do you know in 1961, was the town still operating under the 1954 zoning bylaw? Uh, this came up in one of our prior cases, and it was the same bylaw that got produced in my prior case, and I'm trying to think of what the date on that was. I think it's the same bylaw, okay? okay. Is, yeah. I, yeah, I don't think it was substantially changed between 1954 and 1975. I just wanted to yes, yeah. confirm that that's true. Yeah. Okay. Questions from the board? Okay. Mr. Hanlon. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Nasi, what was the property what was the uh, property zoned as in 1961? What was the zoning district? I believe it was uh, an R2 at, at that time. So uh, I believe it's true that if you look at the 1946 map, um, it appears to me at least that the property was zoned business A at the time. Mm -hmm. 
And there wasn't any R2 yet, that would have been residential B. Um, but if it was business A, that would include any of the residential zones, including an apartment house. Mm -hmm. So here's the map that I'm looking at. And unfortunately, and one question I have is whether or not this was still the, but if you look at where, if you look at, at where this property now is, it's just before you get to Lock Street as you go west, correct? And that area there looks to me is where the house is. And it looks to me as if it was zoned business A. Uh, do you have any idea whether or not that changed between, uh, between the date of this map, whether there was a, another map that uh, intervened between then and 1961? Well, we, I know from the assessing record that the assessing record has it as an R2. Uh, but it, well, as of when? Uh, I, it doesn't tell me that, and I don't know that. R2 didn't exist in 1961 if the 1954 yeah. Uh, yeah. did. So that I suspect is what it currently is. Yeah. What I'm trying to get at, Mr. Inessi, is the possibility that uh, in 1961, the use of at three or four uh, was if it was an apartment house at that time, which was defined in the zoning bylaw ah, as anything that yeah. was three or more apartments, yeah. that it was already allowed and it didn't require um, any particular relief from the zoning board in, in order to uh, justify going from three to four. Three would be a violation of R2. Sure. Yeah. And so I'm exploring whether or not the real analysis of what happened in 1961 is that they were dealing with a prior non-conforming use. Right. And that, uh, or that it became a prior non-conforming use, but it wasn't non-conforming necessarily in 1961. Mm -hmm. In that case, if it went to four in 1961, and then it was rezoned R2 in a subsequent change of the map, uh, it would have whatever rights you would have as a prior non-conforming use. Grandfather, sure, yeah. And in any event, you know that it was already a three because it went from a three to a four in 1961. Uh, so at least more than two was already an established use even before uh, any of this activity that happened in 1961 would be. Does that, does that seem right to you? That's my understanding, yes. yes. Um, so that would suggest it's entirely possible. I mean, we're dealing here with historic reconstruction and we don't know. I would like very much to know what, what the zoning was here. I mean, it should be findable out uh, in 1961 to know if it had been rezoned to residence B, which was the equivalent of R2, uh, yeah. then you're kind of back where you started. Uh, although you might have a prior non-conforming use at three. Yeah. Um, but if it was a conforming use to go to four and then R2 intervened later on, that would put you in a different position and maybe lead you not to have to rely on trying to infer the existence of a zoning record that we don't have. Yeah, uh, I, I would have to check with the building department on that. I don't know whether Mr. Champer is on this Zoom uh, and if even if he is, he probably would not have access immediately to uh, the, the zoning uh, you know, information or the zoning map for that particular period of time. But I can certainly check, uh, uh, look into that, Mr. Ham. I believe that the zoning, that the planning department does have records of all these things all the way yes, back. Yes, they do. So they should they be do. able to ascertain this. Yep. He might be at home. That's my point. Yep. Yeah. Mr. Champ is not on the call this evening. Again, I come back, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hanlon, to the building card uh, dated uh, October 10 of 61. Uh, and query, is, does that have any meaning? Does that have any significance? And uh, should it not have significance uh, to a homeowner 
who basically goes to the building department and looks and checks through the records. Uh, if a homeowner does that, they're going to see that as of 1961, the property, which might have been a three family, probably was a three family before that, uh, became a, a legal four family. So again, I go back to 1961, and that's the date I start with. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So um, I started out with the same question that Mr. Hamlin did, what was the zoning in uh, 1961, but I didn't do the deep dive that he did with respect to the analysis that led to the question as to whether it may have actually been a permitted use or permitted, uh, you know, property change from three to four units. And then that might have predated the rezoning to the R2 district. I think it's important though for our decision to be able to know which approach we're taking. So I think what Mr. Hannon was suggesting and which requires a little bit more information to fill in the blanks is, is a much cleaner approach if it's at all possible. So I'd personally like to see those blanks filled in. If in fact that is not the case and it wasn't a matter of right to switch from three to four, I had a question as to, well, what was it? Was it two and then it was changed to three and was that permissible? And then if it was then changed from three to four, was that permissible? And if it had been zoned for two family at the time, then that might be a, another concern or question. But the other thing that Mr. Nessie addresses in his memorandum is section seven of chapter 40A. And, and I do think that if there is a building permit issued, and I think that's what Mr. Nessie is suggesting, and if then a period of six years or more elapses after the issuance of the building permit, there can't be any enforcement action brought to alter uh, that uh, building permit. And so that led me to the follow-up question of, okay, if in fact there was a building permit issued, if it was issued to convert from three to four families, even if that was an incorrect act on the part of the building department, um, it still seems to be protected. The next question though is, do you get to do more work after the fact? Because you do have the protection of section seven. Um, after that, however, then what wherewithal do we have to say, yes, you can go ahead and you can do more work even though we might think that the initial permit was incorrectly issued. And I don't have any conclusion as to, um, as to that, but I think that that's the next sort of alternative approach if in fact Mr. Hanlon's suggestion is not the uh, path that was actually followed. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon. Uh, <clears throat> I was thinking along, <clears throat> along the same lines. The literal language of Section 7 doesn't match up with this that well. It talks about having springing an action to invalidate the billing permit and to somehow undo the thing that was allowed, which in this case was building an extra room. Um, and there's something, there's, some, there's something of a jump between that and saying that there's a broad, uh, uh, a broad prohibition on questioning the use um, and it seems to me this that if in fact the that the statute is susceptible to that extension uh, or that meaning in this in this context that there's probably some case law or something that enable that interprets it and gives you a sense of what uh, it is that it means surely if mr Anessi was arguing this in uh, the superior court um, he would be looking at seeing what he could get out of the precedents that must exist uh, over time uh, about that. Um, and I just encourage him that if in fact there's any time to do that, I, I'm sort of reluctant to extend that statute into the situation without a little bit more confidence that that's the way the courts would uh, interpret it. 
but in any event, once you decided that it did apply in this kind of situation, you still have got the question that Mr. DuPont raised as to whether that would protect you not only for what was already done, but for all the things that you might want to do based upon something that is an assumption underlying the permit that was previously granted. Um, and a question for Mr. Valarelli. Yes, Mr. Chairman. So the card, uh, this that's a, the basis of Exhibit A. Was is this a card that the that's used for the zone that was used for the zoning board at that time, or was this a building department card? Can, do you know what? Yeah. So the, back in the day, before we had Novus and all the stuff we have now. Um, card catalogs were used to document the uh, zoning hearings. Okay. And this particular zoning hearing was documented, uh, case number 290, docket number 290, that the person went, uh, looks like, uh, alter a three-family dwelling to a four-family dwelling. And it uh, looks like the decision was granted. I think I'm not that familiar with the, really the bones of this case, but I believe that... Um, the building commissioner was not totally convinced that this card uh, in this hearing uh, determination <clears throat> back in the day, mm -hmm. 1961, was good enough to say, okay, this is actually a four unit building, uh, go ahead and remodel it as such. Thus, uh, being uneasy with what he had, uh, it, it came down to uh, Mr. Anessi having to convince the board that in fact, it, what he has is sufficient. Uh, and in fact, the building is a legal four unit building. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, uh, from my perspective, uh, I certainly, uh, Mr. Hanlon, uh, will see what I can do about coming up with uh, what the zoning map showed for the property prior to uh, the uh, zoning case in October of 1961, what the zone, what the property was zoned for. I can, I'm cert certainly I can get that information from the building department. But again, I come back to uh, why do you have this information in the building department if people can't rely on it? Why don't you just throw it away, okay? Uh, if in fact it's meaningless, okay, why would you lead people down the primrose path by having this information, this documentation in the building department that people can, uh, can come in, pull the jacket, see it in the jacket, rely on it, and then find out two, three years later that, no, oh, no, no, the building inspector is saying, well, I'm not sure I want to rely on that. Well, why is it there? Take it out of the jacket. Don't leave it in the jacket. All right. Oh. All right. That's, I, I think I've had my say on that. I can't That's say right. that any more aggressively than I have. Thank you. Are there further questions from the board? Um, we do have a couple hands up, but is, is Mr. Kahan, is, is he the architect? Mr. Nessie, what's your architect's name? Jason Kahn. Oh, Jason Kahn. Um, so I saw Jason has his hand up. Uh, so Jason so Kahn. I, yeah, I think are here. I might have done that inadvertently before. Um, oh, okay. I apologize. I, no, that's I, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, at this point. Well, I'm now going to be opening the meeting for public comment. Uh, public questions and comments will be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. The chair asks that those wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing, please be patient and allow those wishing to speak for the first time to go ahead of them. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participants tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. You'll be called upon by the meeting host. You'll be asked to give your name and address. And you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. And once all public comment, 
and questions have been addressed, uh, the public comment period will be closed. Uh, so with that, um, Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Moore, uh, Piedmont Street. Um, I just uh, very, very quickly, I wanted to say first, uh, I was unable to join you at your last meeting and I, uh, uh, there was a number of issues that came up that would have been of interest to me. I just wanted to say, I want to applaud the board's sensitivity to the three issues that came up at that meeting. Uh, clearly it was discussed on a number of levels and I appreciate that even though I wasn't there. <laughs> So thank you, thank you for that concern. But uh, in terms of the case, uh, my first question would uh, be, did uh, Mr. Anessi say that the uh, assessment office was assessing this building as a four family? Mr. Anessi? The assessing record uh, that I pulled has it as a four to eight unit residential building. I have it in front of me right now. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I would say then that the current owner, as well as any recent previous owner, has been paying taxes on this property as if it was a four-unit property, correct? So is that assumption correct? That would be correct. That, yes. And wouldn't we be able to follow the assessment records back to how far back they've been paying taxes on this property as a four-unit property? I have to assume the assessing records are probably, in this case, more complete in the building records. Believe that would be able to be accomplished. I would therefore just suggest to Mr. Anessi that he go uh, call the historic records of the assessor's office to see how long it's been uh, assessed at a four unit uh, property because I would have to say that if the previous owner or owners have been paying taxes as such, you'd have a very strong case to claim that even if the building department has incorrect records here, almost by almost by historic right, it should be it should be now a four four unit property. I, I would guess. Just uh, just that one point. Uh, also, so and I guess this might be from Mr. Valarelli. I I guess as you said, it was a card catalog system previously. Uh, there are records that are, must be maintained by the building department as card catalog records, but they sound to be somewhat incomplete or, or just they are what they are. And in some cases, the records don't have much detail in them. Uh, that's correct, Mr. Moore. It, the, 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 there, there are so many records, honestly, all over the place. Uh, this comes down uh, to the building commission and not being comfortable enough uh, on his own or uh, given his authority with ISD to declare this a uh, four unit building. And that's why he asked the applicant to reach out to the ZBA for their opinion uh, to uh, see if Mr. Onesi could in fact convince them that it is and was and um, uh, has been a four unit building. Mr. Pellarelli, are some of the issues involved in producing the record due to the fact that the the uh, building department was recently moved from Grove Street over to Maple Street? It's part of it, Mr. Chairman. Uh, unfortunately, CBA records uh, the, this old are kept in three locations. One was uh, the engineering department, which has now been relocated to 23 Maple Street. The basement of the town hall uh, which uh, is just, uh, for lack of a better term, not, not very well organized. Uh, I think every effort was made to dig up the uh, fold of the original jacket for this uh, particular case. I will say this, unfortunately, we, we do have uh, accessibility to just thousands of zoning board cases, uh, dating back to the beginning of time, if you will, we just didn't have this one for some reason. Uh, I don't want to give the board the impression that the, the, the case folders um, are just uh, uh, unaccessible. They are. It just so happens that this one was not. It could be not. It could not be found. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that insight. Um, I if if these records. <laughs> 
we're in the basement of the town hall. I've been there and you're, that's a disaster down there. So <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to say that, Mr. Moore, so thank you. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not sure why more effort has to be placed on cleaning that area. Uh, however, I would suggest in the future, perhaps for Mr. Valoretto to take it to further management that they, when they get interns in the summer, they should put some effort towards the organization of the building department's old records. It's an area which unfortunately seems to get ignored by many boards and commissions. And as is shown clearly by this case, it's a mistake to let that happen. And it needs some effort needs to be put to remediate it. I would think. It, it, it is. And if I can, uh, to Mr. Champa's credit, he has already started that process. Oh, uh, excellent. Yeah, so we are actually in a temporary location now at Maple Street, uh, he heading back uh, someday soon, I hope, uh, to Grove Street in a much better organized situation than we ever had before. Uh, yeah. prior, prior, prior to the renovation of that building, we just didn't have the room. That's why stuff was moved to the town hall and engineering and all over the place. But um, doesn't doesn't much help us on this particular case. But uh, that um, that move is in the works, uh, Mr. Chairman. That's excellent to hear. I'm very I'm happy to hear that the, the new building inspector is putting efforts that direction. It sounds like they're on a path to improvement, which is great. One last quick point I'd like to make is when this case is resolved, there are a number of significant trees around this building, and I just want to remind the architect and the developer and the owner that they're going to have to protect those large trees that are all in the setbacks. And if you're going to do significant construction, that will have serious implications for those trees. You'll have to talk to the uh, tree warden about it. Thank we you. Are very, we are very sensitive to that, to, to the tree issue in this town. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, next on the list is Mr. Seltzer. Uh, thank you, Don Seltzer. Um, I was just looking at sorry, the historic. Sorry, I just need to. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, Irving Street. Um, and I was just looking at the historical record for it. This is the uh, Benjamin Locke store, um, built apparently by the son of the more famous Benjamin Locke of the Monotony Minutemen. And apparently it was built originally as a store, and then it was converted to a two-family house in the mid-1800s, and it was still a two-family house in 1912 but the records I see here don't go any further than that. Um, but two historical photos that I've uncovered clearly show it having four mailboxes in front. And if we could date these photos, one of which is in the collection of the Arlington Historical Society, I believe it might give a better idea of when it was converted to a four family. Great point, thank you for that. It's a very good point, Mr. Salsa. Yes. Yeah. And that's a photo that you, you said, the, is that the Arlington Historical? Well, I, I'm coming up with two photos. One is in the uh, MACRIS uh, database, yep. which I thank you for alerting to me many months ago. And if you do, you zoom in on it, it's clear it's got four mailboxes. I don't know. I can't date the photo from that. The doing a quick search of the historical society records brought up uh, a better photo, which also has four mailboxes in the front. Um, and it doesn't have a clear date on what I found online, but maybe checking with this historical society, they might have some photos that are dated and would um, might provide something useful. Thank you very much for that. Good point. there any further public questions or comments? Any further public comments? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close the public comment hearing uh, period for this hearing. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, so 
a little while ago, I outlined one possible avenue to for looking at this that, as Mr. DuPont said, had some gaps in the record. And it has one thing that Mr. Inessi pointed to that I wanted to, to comment on. And, and that is that the record exhibit A that we have in front of us clearly indicates that something happened in 1961. Uh, it indicates that there was some some something was granted and that was apparently not by the that was apparently by the zoning board um, and that it, it seems to be a three family to a, a four family where three family wouldn't be compliant with an R2 zone either. Um, it's not clear what the reason is why it is that they would seek the maybe it was a why they would exceed uh, need to get the zoning board approval to, to do that, but something apparently happened. Um, Mr. Chapa's article argument is more or less concedes that the zoning board took some action that at that time authorized a uh, moving to a you know, four family dwelling. Uh, what Mr. Chapa's concern is that is that that doesn't necessarily, that was often, in his view, made uh, time limited in a way that you can't be sure that if on October 11th, 1961, it was okay to have a four family dwelling, uh, that that would continue to be true throughout the decades all the way up to, to uh, uh, now. Um, and I guess, Mr. Mr. Anessi has suggested that in his experience, making these things time limited or limited by uh, the owner and something was not typical. And Mr. Chompa suggests that it was. And it's on that degree of uncertainty that the debate in this case rests. Um, because if in fact, you could be, re Mr. Chompa seems to accept that, but for the possibility that this was limited or conditioned in such a way that the permission that was given in 1961 is no longer good, um, then I think he would concede that this is evidence that the permission was in fact given. Um, and I guess that's a fact question as to what the practice was uh, in those days. And uh, I certainly respect Mr. Anessi's memory. He was, he was there and I wasn't quite old enough to be there. Um, and <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chapa clearly wasn't very old enough to be there, but presumably has has looked back to see what the practice was. So if we're going to take this route and follow the the case as it has been laid out for us by the building inspector, uh, that it, I would sort of like to understand a little better. Uh, what the actual probability is that uh, 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 that the action that appears to be noted in the Exhibit A uh, might have been conditioned in such a way that we can't rely on the on on that, but have to make sure that it wasn't somehow uh, reversed later on or the condition expired later on. Am I allowed to say something, Mr. Klein? Mr. Nessie. Yes. Uh, I, I hear what you're saying, Mr. Hanlon, and uh, you're an attorney and I'm an attorney. Uh, and we've uh, both presumably tried cases. I've tried many. You probably have as well. And uh, I think that uh, for me to suggest to you that it would be pure speculation to try to surmise uh, that in fact, there was some sort of a condition subsequent to uh, the grant from a three family to a four, when in fact, you don't have that language on the building card. Uh, if there was in fact a condition, a limiting condition with respect to the grant of zoning relief, then certainly from an evidentiary point of view uh, in a court of law, that would have to be in that form because otherwise you could never get the speculation you're talking about into evidence uh, because the judge would never allow it. 
So I'm suggesting that uh, again, the building card is the key here. We look at the building card, uh, we see the language in the building card. We don't see any limiting language in that building card, uh, notwithstanding what Mr. Mr. Champer might have said uh, and, and you know believed to be the practice back in the 60s and the 70s about uh, you know grants being limited and the like. None of that language is contained on the card. And the card is the only document that could go into evidence in a court of law. The speculation could never make it uh, to uh, over the rail to the jury. All right, that's, that's all I need to say about that. Mr. Chairman. DuPont. So I, uh, I see this as sort of three times on a fork. Um, the first is that this was a special permit or some version of a special permit because as we see the apparently, according to what Mr. Valerelli had explained, this is a record that references action taken by the board. And a question I have is whether or not at that time, if in fact this was a special permit, whether special permits were grant were uh, recorded as they are currently at the Registry of Deeds. And that would be something of an important question for me to have answered because if you do get a special permit and you don't record it, I believe you lose your rights. So I'm not sure that this is a special permit, but I'd be interested to know if at the time special permits were in fact uh, decisions, favorable decisions were recorded. So there's that possibility that this was granted uh, in, in accordance with the zoning bylaw at the time and it was converted from a three to a four family. Uh, the other possibility as Mr. Hanlon was sort of exploring earlier is that perhaps this was actually a matter of right uh, that you had a zoning district that permitted this type of three or four unit building. But then of course that begs the question as to why you would have had a special permit request put in if you could do it as a right. But those two possibilities at least exist in my mind. The third is that these were not, uh, that this building card shows that there was in fact a decision that allowed the uh, conversion from a three to a four family, but that somehow it did not conform with the zoning law at the time. And that there was a building permit issued for the construction and that that building permit was actually issued in error. And then we get back to the section 40A, section seven that Mr. Inessi um, had cited in his memorandum, that would protect what's there. And I think we've said this already, so not to belabor the point, but that would protect what's there. But then the question arises as to whether it would permit any further um, modification of what's there. I would like to know the answers to those things as best as we can in order to make the decision. And I do agree with Mr. Nessie that if at the end of the day, this is all we have, then we have to deal with that fact mm -hmm. and make a decision based upon common sense as well as you know how we view the zoning bylaw. So at the moment, I'm just saying that I'm not really in a position to make an informed decision. And I would like a little bit of follow-up on both what Mr. Hanlon had suggested earlier and any of the other questions which may seem open. I intend to follow up with Mr. Hanlon's suggestion, uh, as I said earlier, uh, Mr. DuPont, for sure. Uh, just to forward Mr. DuPont's first question on to Mr. Valerelli, the question about whether special permits would have been registered with the Registry of Deeds back in the early 60s. Do you know? Uh, Mr. Chairman, according to Mr. Champa's memo, he researched that and found that. The, the, so this one is not, but do you know if it was standard practice at the time to file? I do not. I do not. Mr. Nessi, do you know if it was practiced back in I, then? Well, I quite frankly do not remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> you know, Mr. Chairman, we keep doing these forensic zoning cases now. I feel like it's cold case files. Yeah. And right. it's it's on earth all of the laws from the bowels of whatever building they're contained in. So it's interesting, but it's also a challenge, I think, for the applicants these days. No, oh, absolutely. My, my position would be that uh, even if they it had to be reported, I still fall back on Chapter 40A, Section 7. That's all I'll say about that. So uh, is there a further question for Mr. Valorelli. If the board was to find that, in fact, the four family was an allowed use and this property could continue as a four family, um, then the four family use would be considered pre-existing non-conforming um, in regards to the, to the current bylaw. Um, and as such, would the board need to make a finding under Section 811 on an ex on a um, uh, an alteration, reconstruction, extension, or structural change? All right, that's actually that's in relation to a single-family home, non-conforming uses. Change in non-conforming use. That's the non-conforming non -conforming accessory uses. Permit is not going to be changed. I will apply to any change of substantial extensions to use building permits. Or general Not entirely sure if we're required to make a finding or not. Mr. Chairman, you were asking if there would be an extension of a non-conformity. Is that, is that where you're going? So just because the this, I, I haven't even looked to see, I, I mean, I'm, I know that the use would be non-conforming um, and there would be an alteration to non-conforming use. It, I, I'm not convinced that the board needs to make a determination in regards to an alteration of a structure with a pre-existing non-conforming use, but are there, is there, are there any alterations to the property that would be required because of the building being a non-conforming structure, um, which I'm assuming it is because there's no front yard setback and there's almost no rear yard setback with the exception of the, the dog leg portion of the site. Well, that's correct. So I think the question before the board tonight, um, do they think that Mr. Nessie has provided enough evidence to convince the board that it is in fact, it was a four family unit and still is based on the evidence that Mr. Nessie uh, presented that the board is comfortable with that. A lot of other things will go on here, such as it's, 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 it exceeds three units, so automatically we're into uh, fire suppression systems and the like, but those are building code issues. So uh, ISD will deal with that. But 
would the board be required to make any findings um, on the structure? I did, I'm just trying to figure out basically if the board was to say, you know, the, the board is a, you know, was to accept the four units, would the applicant then have to file for a special permit under section eight for work on, an, on a pre-existing non-conforming structure? Um, no, without examining the plans, I don't think they are becoming more non-conforming. Okay. Again, just a quick look, but I saw no expansion of the footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, maybe a reduction in GFA, I don't know. Okay. But certainly when the when the plans are under review in the special services, if questions were to come up on that regard, then they could come back to us at that time. They could. In fact, it's happened. It happened um, to Highland Bev just uh, two months ago. All right. Okay. M Mr. Chairman, I had a question about that as well. Sure. Um, so I, on the on the um, GFA spreadsheet on page twelve of today's agenda, it looked like the increase in GFA was about uh, eleven hundred square feet. Uh, so I was wondering, um, does that mean that we're also asking about a large addition, in addition to the designation as a four unit structure? I believe we're staying within the existing foundation, Rick. If we're staying within the existing uh, foundation, would there be a need for any relief with respect to a large addition? It would not, Mr. Nessie. That only applies to a full expansion of the footprint. Thank you. Thank you. No, you're welcome. But in, in looking at the, the table as well, if the attic floor is proposed to be 1,645 square feet, and the second floor is 2,272 square feet. That's more than 50%. So it's no longer a two and a half story building. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we may have to look at, and I'm uh, not 100% sure. Uh, it's a little ambiguous because I believe that that only applies to one and two family units. Now we are dealing with a four family unit and a two family zone. I don't know, but I do know this much. Mm -hmm. uh, if it does apply, then they are right back to the board for another issue. Yeah, okay. my intent is if I make it by the zoning board with respect to the issue that I brought before the board, my intent is to uh, file pl plans with the building department. And if in fact we need relief at that point, Chris, then he's gonna send us back to you folks. Okay. Are there further questions from the board? None. I'm going to go ahead and stop the share here. So at this stage, does the board feel that they have sufficient information to reach a decision on this case? Or do we, is there additional information that we would like to have available to us before we can make a decision? I know there's some questions about um, go back to my notes here. Firm. Any information about what the use was? I think there's some questions about what the use was prior to 1961. Um, and so, Mr. Mr. Seltzer had brought us up, up. Yeah, there was a two-family in 1912, and then there's a question in regards to when um, the house appeared to have four mailboxes and then we have a record that it changed from three to four in 1961. Do we, 
have inf enough information at this time or is, is there more information we're looking for? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Mr. DuPont indicated earlier that there was, you know, several, there were three different approaches or three different times here, all of which required a little bit more information. And Mr. Inessi has already indicated his willingness to go and run some of these things down. And I would, I personally would like to give him the opportunity to do that so that we can, that we can operate on a, on a firmer footing here. Mm -hmm. I would like to do that. Yes. Can we clarify what those three things are? Mr. Uh, let me I can tell you what I think they are. It, okay. That, okay. That would be perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right. One of them is what was the use uh, of the property prior to 1961? Uh, uh, the, if, if I can ascertain that. Uh, Mr. Handlin had asked, uh, what was the zone that the property was in in 1961? At the time, the zoning board uh, granted the relief they granted from a three to a four. Uh, Mr. DuPont has asked uh, whether uh, a zoning decision had to be reported in 1961, and I can easily find that out, I'm sure. Uh, and Mr. Handel also had some questions about the implication and the reach of chapter 40A, section seven, I'll see what I can do about shedding some light on that as well. And uh, Mr. Salsa brought up a very good point, which I'm going to see what I can find out about in terms of those four mailboxes. And I'm going to see if I can ascertain when that, those fo th that photo would have been taken showing four mailboxes, because that would show as of that date that it probably was a for family use. That's what I have. I may be missing something. That Mr. sounds really complete, Mr. Hanlon. I just wanted to point out that while the decision in 1961 uh, says something about it going from a three to a four, that doesn't necessarily mean that it hadn't been used at some point prior to that as a four. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, you know, the, it would be interesting to know that if it had you know, if it had been used as a force, say in 1955 or 1946 or whatever, that would have a bearing on a bigger bearing on where we are than if we just confirmed that after 1964, 61, it became a four because it's to be assumed that that that's what the point of uh, of Exhibit A is. Is there any additional information we were? Hoping to achieve. Looking around the board, I see none. With that, um, I think we would be looking to continue this hearing. Uh, Mr. Nessie, would you be amenable to that? I would, I, absolutely. So we would be looking to continue. Um, until Tuesday, February 22nd. I'm just noticing now it's 222-2022. February 22nd, 2022 at 7.30 p.m. That's fine with the applicant. Um, may I have a motion to that effect? I moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Dupont. Uh, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. The chair votes aye. We are continued on 1113 Lowell Street until Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022 at 730. Thank you all for your time. Mr. Aye. Chairman? Yes, sir. I'd like to point out that as a result of all this, there are no new opinions to write as a, law, as a result of this of this meeting, uh, something for which I thank you all. <laughs> yeah. All right. We now return back to the start of our agenda. Um, so back to item number two which is the approval of meeting minutes from December 21st, 2022. These minutes were distributed by 
Mr. Valarelli to the board for comment. Um, I know comments were received. Are there any additional comments in regards to the minutes from December 21st, 2021? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the minutes from December 21st, 2021? So <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mills. Second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Vote aye. Those minutes are approved. That brings us to item number three on our agenda, approval of the decision for 238 Park Avenue. Um, so this was distributed, uh, this was written by Mr. Hanlon, distributed to the board for comment. Um, has everyone had an opportunity to review the decision? Okay. Um, are there any additional questions or comments on in regards to the, that decision? Seeing none, um, I, I have a motion to approve the final decision for 238 Park Avenue. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, may I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Vote of the board, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. The chair votes aye. That is approved. Brings us to item four on our agenda, the approval of decision for 47 Crosby Street. Um, again, this is a decision written by Mr. Hanlon, uh, circulated to the board for questions and comments. Are there any further questions or comments in regards to 47 Crosby Street? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the final decision for 47 Crosby Street? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. 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 Mr. Mills. Uh, vote of the board, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Mr. Holly, are you there? Sorry. Aye. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So that motion is approved. Brings it up to item number five on our agenda approval decision for 1618 Swan Place. Uh, this is a decision that I wrote, it circulated to the board for questions and comments. Are there any further questions and comments in regards to the final decision for 1618 Swan Place? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the final decision for 1618 Swan Place? Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. A second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. <laughs> a vote of the board, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Chair votes aye. So that final decision is approved. Brings to item number six on our agenda, which is the approval of the decision for 121 Brattle Street. Um, this is a decision written by Mr. Hanlon, circulated to the board for questions and comments. Are there any further questions or comments in regards to 121 Brattle? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the final decision for 121 Brattle Street? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I have a second? Second. Mr. Mills, a uh, vote of the board, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That one is approved. Brings us to item number seven, uh, discussion of potential zoning bylaw amendments. So I had circulated to the board um, prior a list of six potential uh, zoning articles. Um, which were sort of based on the practice that we've had recently. Um, so I had brought those to the attention of the Zoning Bylaw Working Group, uh, which is a town group of which I'm a member. Um, and from there, they were discussed yesterday evening at the uh, Arlington Redevelopment Board's meeting. Uh, the Redevelopment Board has agreed to take them on as their own articles. Um, so they, are, they have recommended them along with four additional articles uh, to be included on the warrant that has gone to the select board and to uh, town council. Town council has agreed to, um, has accepted them. So 
um, those six articles will be going forward um, onto the warrant. And uh, I'm not entirely sure what the hearing schedule is going to be for the redevelopment board in regards to those, but the redevelopment board will be um, having public hearings on all of those. And if anyone is interested in, in following along or being a part of that process, let me know and I'm happy to share anything on that. Mr. That's Chair? Fine. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Um, it seems to me that, that I mean, I've, I've seen and, and, and support all of these amendments. It, it does seem to me to be important that this body, which gets so used to the ways in which the zoning bylaw just doesn't work, where it, it, there's frictions, there's inconsistencies, there's what there usually is. It, it's almost as bad as the tax code. And the only way that, that people actually get an opportunity to, to, to figure out how to make those incremental improvements, which don't catch the imagination and don't blow with the winds of the time is if this body takes responsibility for articulating these things and, and working to make it, uh, to make it work better. Um, and it seems to me that it's important for the town that we do that. Uh, because when you have a situation where the zoning bylaw doesn't mean what it seems to mean or whatever, uh, it begins to cause people to lose confidence in the bylaw itself. And that in turn leads to uh, a, a sort of an atmosphere in the world that we're living in that uh, is more typical of Washington, DC. So I would think that it's very useful and I'm thankful to the chairman for bringing these things up and that it's a really important uh, role for this board to play and I'm looking forward to uh, to doing that. Thank you and it the um, the ARB was very receptive to uh, to the discussion and um, I think they were you know, very gracious in accepting all six of them under their own um, under their own auspices because they are allowed to put items directly on the warrant, which the Zoning Board of Appeals is not allowed to do. Um, and they did you know, speak uh, very favorably of working with the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, both on these, but also in the future um, to, to be able to, to more fully vet what, you know, what may be, need to be changed in the zoning bylaws or what, what little things need to be adjusted. So these are the just things up. So these were the six that we had talked about before. Um, <clears throat> and all six of these will be discussed further at the ARB. So with that, we have exhausted all our business for this evening. I know it's very early for us, but. Not a bad thing. Um, and then our next hearing, um, as was stated several times, is going to be Tuesday, February 22nd at 7.30 p.m. And Mr. Valorelli, I think you said there might be two, two new cases on that date? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. I have two very incomplete uh, applications. And if they are uh, submitted in time, uh, time to advertise, then we'll put those on the list for the 22nd. I'll let the board know as soon as possible. Perfect. Anything further this evening? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mills. i just like uh, to take the opportunity to thank you and Patrick for your hard work on this board. Pat has done uh, yeoman's work writing up these uh, decisions. Time after time, he's made an excellent model, as was shown in your recent decision you wrote up. <laughs> I mean, that was a difficult decision, sworn place, you know, with the variance and all that and the subtleties to carry it forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you guys have done a great job, Pat. You know, you really did have a goal of making these uh, much more uniform and easy to follow. And you've done a land office job. Just great job. Thank you. To totally agree, Mr. Mills. Totally agree. Same here. Thank you very much, Mr. Mills.
So with that, I would like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's yeah. meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I would especially like to thank Rick Valorelli and Vincent Lee for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of our proceedings. It's our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be made available available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days or weeks. If anyone has any comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. To conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all so very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay healthy. Have a great night.